each of my esteemed industry luminaries here tonight have been involved in the writing, producing or devising of TV series with specific leads in mind. Rachel Lang is co-creator and writer of series Blue Rose, which is currently screening on TV3. It stars Antonia Preble and Siobhan Marshall. Stephen O'Mar is the producer of Harry, starring Oscar Keitley, soon to screen on TV3. And Robin Malcolm is the star of Agent Anna, currently playing on TV1. They're going to talk tonight about their experiences creating or writing series around the actors. Did you know that? <laughs> so, um, first of all, I just... So I'm just here as a moderator and keep things going and hopefully you'll ask questions so I won't have to do too much. But what I thought I'd do is throw, begin by asking each of them what the development process was for their series that we're talking about and what place the actor had, the lead actors had in that process. Yeah? So, Stephen. I think that is a good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll go first because... Uh, Harry's the one show that hasn't been seen, and obviously Blue Rose and, and Agent Anna have debuted, and they're both really, really top-class um, shows. Uh, I think, again, because no one's seen Harry, and you'll see a little bit of it later on tonight, I'll, I'll say very little because I think Rachel and, and, and Robin have probably got heaps that you can learn from, but the genesis of Harry was fundamentally me watching... Um, Cracker in the 80s, uh, in the 90s, late 80s, 90s, and also um, Prime Suspect, um, because I, what struck me about those, both of those shows was that a strong central cop is really engaging if it's really well written. And fundamentally, the idea for a New Zealand equivalent of Cracker or a Prime Suspect, and it was again, again very broad, without any conscious thinking of it, it had to be, if it was to be set in Auckland, then it had to reflect an Auckland that was the largest Polynesian city in the world. And I don't mean a, a, a certain part of Auckland, it had to reflect the whole of Auckland. And I had an idea, while I had a want, I had no specific thoughts as to who the chief or the central character should be, until one day I saw the Naked Samoans at, um, just long here actually, at the town hall, and I saw Oscar Kitely in Go Home, and I'd known Oscar socially for a long time, and um, we're friends, but never once in the genesis of Harry had he occurred to me as the obvious choice as a lead, because of Sionese and Brotown, and it's just his, his sheer comic talent, he is always Oscar the funny man. But that night on stage, um, it was like, you know, cliche, this is but a bolt from the blue. It was Oscar was Harry. It was no more um, pronounced than that. And so I arranged to have a coffee with him soon after and just pitched him the idea of Harry. And I think straight away, Oscar said yes, but the, 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 the rightness of my choice was I went to TV3, who we'd just done out of the blue with, and I took them a photograph of Oscar. It, I'd cropped it from Sionese just put the words Harry over it and showed that to Katerina Denave. And on the strength of Oscar's face and that word Harry, Katerina said, we want this series. Now, it wasn't quite that simple from there on in, but I think that goes to show the power of the right face, the right character, and because it was one of the only shots we found of Oscar looking grim and serious, Sun suddenly he wasn't Oscar the funny man in Katerina's eyes just at that moment. He was a believable, dramatic um, lead. And so that really is the basis of Harry, an idea wanting to create an, an iconic New Zealand cop. And um, how far down the development track were you before you thought of Oscar? Probably I'd spent, I mean, I don't know exactly, Gavin, but probably somewhere about six or seven months on various Were ideas. There any scripts? No, hell no. No, these, these are just me. These, these were doodlings. And then Oscar, and uh, let's talk to Oscar. Yes, you do know the story about Cracker, don't you? No. Um, Jimmy McGovern didn't hire... I, he was going to write it, I think, um, no, for, for himself. No, Jimmy McGovern had already written it, and his lead cop was a skinny, chain-smoking, nervous, ferret of a man. And the producer suggested Robbie Coltrane, who was a comedian, and Jimmy McGovern went, oh, bullshit. Out well, actually, no, I, just, I didn't know that part. <laughs> the thing also is that Oscar is, um, like a lot of comics, what I, whatever I saw in Go Home clearly had dramatic chops because 
Robbie Coltrane and Eric Banner, both of those started life as, you know, as, as funny people, and mm. Billy Crystal going back. Mm. But all of them could, could convey themselves as, as naturally as really successful dramatic actors. And the other thing I'll just say is later on is that but after getting Oscar involved, it was really apparent that if you're going to tell a story about cops that's authentic and gritty, you need to have a real cop involved. So we got a, um, the most famous... Uh, policeman in South Auckland who worked for 27 years and never and, and solved every case he did. His name was Neil Grimstone, also known as Grim, and Grim's here tonight. You should check him out. He is worth a series in himself. And we got Grim to be part of the writing team, and also we chose um, a friend of mine who's a successful commercials director, and his name's Chris Dudman. He'd won lots of awards for commercials and short films. And but so because this isn't a promo for Harry, it is a I'm promo for Harry. I'm just going to uh, stick to the questions about the development process, if that's all right. No, well, the thing is, what um, I wanted to say is that team was a development process. So you had no scripts or no no you, no character notes or anything like that. You it had was an idea of for setting something with a cop in crudely a, speaking Poly Polynesian Auckland, and you you saw Oscar and went, he could be the guy. Yeah. So could Robin? Could I ask what what was your involvement with Agent Anna? Where did that come from? Uh, unemployment. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> seriously, you know, uh, I, I've always, um, since drama school, you know, and any actors in the room could probably attest to this, you know, you, you kind of learn that there's the, the world out there that offers you jobs, you know, you, you go and you audition for them and you get them and your responsibility is as an actor and that happens and it comes and goes and then there are these patches in your career which are a little, um, a little <laughs> blanker than that and you can either sit at home or you can try and make something and you know way back in the day we would make something at Bats Theatre or we would you know you, you just find something to do because you want to act and then uh, I remember when Shortland Street finished you know Simon and Tim and Katie and I formed the New Zealand Actors Company because we you know, we wanted some work. And after Outrageous Fortune finished, I remember reading a quote from a, an actor in America who'd been in a very successful television series, and she'd said, you know, quite truthfully, she said, there's a moment where you kind of go into actor prison for a bit because you're so known as a particular character. And I remember kind of reading that statement and thinking, I, 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 I get that. Um, I'm going to go to Australia and get some work in Australia for a while, which is what I did. But I always wanted to come back here. So right through that time, I, you know, I had some friends who were real estate agents, and I bought and sold a few houses, and I was really fascinated with the idea of real estate myself. And I just started writing some of the stories down which I'd heard, and uh, and I just, you know, it was a bit of a play thing for a little bit. And, and slowly I just put together a very, um, a very unprofessional document. It wasn't even a document, it was a really long email. And <laughs> 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 probably written after 10 p.m. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just sort of full of stories and characters and ideas and dreams and fantasies and hopes and all the rest of it. And I took it to Great Southern Television and they... Uh, Rachel and Phil surprisingly, terrifyingly said, oh, this is really fucking great. We love this. And so we, we just sort of talked around the table for a bit and it was very sort of, I mean, I mean, you guys will have much more experience with this process than I, than, than I have, but it was very unformed for a long time. And I guess the next significant part of the process, which was to do with the actor involvement, was um, we, uh, we got Maxine Fleming in, you know, in a series of writers and um, we talked a lot about the character. We just talked a lot about who this woman could be, you know, if, if you set up the world of real estate, which is a fascinating world in itself, and if you're going to... Sorry, plonk, can I just ask, just yeah. to clarify, so you took to Great Southern the idea of it being set in a real estate agent, was it? Was I, I took the idea of a television series set in a real estate company, like, right, like right. making a television series around real estate. With, with a woman working there as the lead, with you, yourself in mind? With a, um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry, I mean, I wanted to, you know, I mean, it was, it, I mean, it was pure self-interest, you know. Yeah. I, I wanted to work. I wanted to work in New Zealand. I wanted to do something completely different to Outrageous Fortune. I wanted to, and I wanted to have some kind of involvement in the development of it because I, you know, I'm a, 
fucking squeaky wheel and I like to be in there, you know, and so I wanted it. I wanted that experience and I wanted to start learning, you know. And, uh, and we made a monologue. We wrote a monologue, um, just of Anna. And we sent that to, I think this is right, and we sent this to, um, to TVNZ and they kind of loved it and backed it. And then we, we just sat around a table and started making up stories. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a teeny tiny show at, at this point, but it was all about um, uh, the, the significant parts of the process for me were we, we got actors in at various points and we, we sort of kind of workshopped and jammed the stories and we sat around the cam cameras here, we sat around and kind of improvised around a table and came up with little happy accidents and little stories and... So, all right, so yeah. I'll just... So I'll move on to Rachel's develop yeah. and then we'll go back and to the script yeah. scripting part of it. As a, so, we can follow it through if that's all right. so, Rachel, with Blue Rose, um. what was the initial development process and how did it involve the two leads? Um, well, it had Blue Rose had quite a long development process. Um, it stemmed back to a time, I mean, I think one of the misconceptions about television series in New Zealand is that you always know you'll do another one, and the fact is none of us ever do because it's always um, dependent on ratings and uh, audience and whether the funder is going to fund it. So there was kind of a period of nervousness some time ago, <laughs> a long time ago, about Outrageous Fortune, and they asked us for other ideas. Um, and so, and they were saying, is, is, is there anything you can do with the cast? And James and I had been talking, in fact, this, this idea goes back to Shorten Street, the conspiracy of receptionists, um, Kirsty Knight being the original um, plucky receptionist. Um, and so we started talking about what would happen if the West Sisters went to town um, to change the kind of model. And so that's where it started as an idea. And it went through a very long development process which kept changing over the years as people would go, oh, yeah, we like it, but no, don't, don't do it now, do something else. So we, we were far too busy for a long time. Um, we liked the ideas of the West Sisters coming to town initially because we thought that was funny and we could bring everyone else in in a different form, but then it changed to something else. So then it was looking at those, those actresses again and coming up with characters that were not the same. I mean, for me, I just thought it was really important that those, they had a very different dynamic, um, that the power balance between them was different. And so James and I kicked around ideas about what, what, that would, what they would be and, and what kind of people they would be, and that's what they became. And at, at some point, we had to sit down with um, Tony and Siobhan and said, look, this is what we're thinking about these characters. What do you reckon? And they went, great, when are we making it? And, w and that was about two and a half years or three years before we did make it. Cool. So, Stephen, you've got Oscar on board and Katerina interested. W what was the next stage, if you like, of developing a series around a lead actor, who you already know the lead actor is? Um, <laughs> I'm just smiling because... As you know, Gavin, the, the road from idea <laughs> to production is never quite as linear as, as you, when you look back and tell a story. And I'll be honest, um, uh, once we had the idea, and this is before Grimm and Chris came on board, um, Katerina left and TV3's enthusiasm for Harry cooled and it required... So how long ago was this? Nothing. Well, we, we did Out of the Blue in 2006 right. and TV3 was the network um, who backed Out of the Blue when no one wanted to do it. And so that's why we had some credit in the bank with, with the network and also with um, Katerina. But as I said, I can't remember when she left. But when did she go? 2008, was that? Sydney. And so therefore there was a bit of a holding pattern. And then Rachel Jean came on board and the project reignited. And so I suppose Oscar and I, for those, um, probably for a year, would, would talk. We filmed just like um, Robin, you did. We, we, we sat around and we filmed and discussed the character of Harry. And, we, and there was a template document, but as I said, you know, jumping the gun, the reason that became apparent really early, early on was that we'd pitched this as being a really gritty cop series. Because again, I'd be, I'm trying not to be ungenerous, because I think one of the things New Zealanders do really well is knock other, other projects and other series, but historically, I will say, I think our cop shows have been lame or our crime shows have, have been a bit average. They've either been, to me, either transplanted American shows trying to make them work here. And also I think the way we've always had with, um, particularly with our Samoan leads, 
I think there have been three, but fundamentally they've always played a sort of, to my mind, and I'm, I'm, I'm Palangi, but they've always struck me as sort of being very white oriented, the characters. And one of the things that Oscar, one of the th things he insisted on, what well, we both insisted on together, was that Oscar was going to turn a lot of his personal experiences into Harry. So Harry wasn't going to be a character that cre was created from above and, and came down to page. He was going to, in some respects, come out of Oscar's experience. And one of the things, I mean, Oscar's one of the most famous, lovable New Zealanders. He, he, he's in two, you know, current celebratory books, The Power of Us and another one, these coffee table books, you know. Oscar is every man. He's been awarded by the government. I figure it's, you know, it's over you or something like that. He's loved. But he has experienced, um, even as a celebrity, um, a lot of racism, a lot of very subtle racism, a lot of hurtful racism. And I think that has governed, it would, it, of course it's governed who he is, but it's also meant that he brings to the writing table or to the storylining table an, a unique sense that I, as an Irish Catholic from Taranaki, could never do in a million years. He brings a particularly unique sensibility. And as Harry is a cop in the, um, in the largest Polynesian city in the world, you need that degree of authenticity. But again, because unlike you, the three of you guys with your credits, we were, to some extent, were stroke our finding our way as we were going around making Harry, we, we realised that, again, all of our experience of cops were all to do with cinema or TV. None of them were real life cops, other than, you know, so we looked at, you know, some reality TV shows, and it was just sort of, again, we were going around in a circle. None of our police story or our police characters were based on real life, and so that became a big, urgent SOS for Oscar and I let's get um, a professional, hence we got Grimm. If Oscar had walked under a bus at some of the one stage of this and you had to keep developing the process, do you think it would have fundamentally changed? Utterly. Right. So and I'd be honest, I, th I suspect if Oscar up until now, he hasn't quite finished his ADR, <laughs> so we still can't afford for him to fall under a bus, but <laughs> at, at any stage, I think the nervousness of the network um, and not just this particular, I think, I, I think there's a lot riding on it because, and most of all for Oscar, because he's taking a hell of a punt. He is, he's got so much as he credit and cachet in the bank with the, with the public, he doesn't need to do this. So for him to do this is both a testimony to the project, but also I think the, his courage because he wants to extend his repertoire. He's not just someone, he's, a, he's an intriguing, tardy, very funny and very honourable man. And he's all of these things at once, and yet there's a rage with him in him. You know, and I don't know if he's here, but I think he's a short film tonight. But if, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a quiet anger, and I don't know what it's about, but it's, it's really interesting when you see him on screen. So how did this translate in the process of the script? So I, I'm speaking as a writer here, because you, you've got the scripts and you're shooting your scenes, and presumably the director is locked out based on the scripts. Was there Well, again, one of the things we did, be because Oscar, effectively there were, there were three of us, Chris, the director, well, actually I should explain that we did another thing, and originally we were going to shoot Harry, and the whole series is like a film, so it was going to be completely shot out of sequence, mm -hmm. and Chris um, was going to do every episode. The sheer logistics of doing that were, uh, it was just impossible for one man. It was putting too much pressure on Chris to do that. So we brought in Pete Berger to, um, to effectively field direct a couple of episodes. But the point is, Chris Dudman was and is the key creative voice on Harry. He was the lead writer and he is the series director. So his credit will be series director. And the reason I'm saying this is that when it came time to film the scenes with Oscar, because Chris and Oscar and Grimm and I'd, I'd been there, so I'd seen it firsthand, but, but the three of them had shaped the character so much that by the time we effectively were doing pre-production as we, would write, as we were writing the scripts. So once it came time to, um, to film Oscar's scenes, Chris wasn't like a director who just sort of seen the script a couple of weeks you know, ago. He knew exactly where Harry's motivation was and is going. Um, but like anything, it's, you know, knowledge is, is helpful, but it doesn't necessarily make it easier. And possibly stressful. Oh, I think we've, <laughs> well, I think we've got a, we've cornered the market on stress in this project. It's, it's really been, ch it's been tough because, again, and this is not, you know, blowing smoke up your guys' asses, but, you know, you have, you have, look at the credits. When Esther read them out before, I was thinking, crikey. You know, you have, you have, and James, 
prim primarily have the wealth of drama writing experience in New Zealand. And, you know, you'll have had your highs and lows, and it wasn't until I met you guys and This Is Not My Life that I realised, crikey, you, you, know, you guys really do know how to write. And again, I don't mean that in, all in a falsely... Because, no, it's really important, but the thing, and the thing which I think is overlooked, which I'd never appreciated, is that you have a work ethic for it. You work. You work all hours of the day, and you work on weekends. And again, I'm, this is not the time or place, but I think there's a, there's a general lack of that work ethic in too many New Zealand writers. I'll, I'll pass that on to Oscar. So, um, <laughs> no, no I, and I, I am definitely not meaning <laughs> So we've, we've got you at the table with people and the idea that you've taken to Great Southern, who are the producers, if no one knew that. So that's the production company, and they set up meeting, set this up. Who funded it at this stage? What was paying for it? Uh, God. Um, uh, New Zealand on air. I mean, I guess we, we, we got a little bit of development money via TVNZ, you know, so they, um, I, I think TVNZ may have put a little, honestly, don't quote me on this, I'm not, I'm not good on this, but um, uh, uh, TVNZ and New Zealand on, on air, I think, funded the development. Uh, some development process. Yeah, for, the, for, for some early scripts, yeah. So then what was the step between, I guess, that stage and the stage of having scripts that you could shoot? How, how involved were, were you... In, in uh, oh no, I was yeah, I was pretty involved. I mean, I kind of, I had, I guess you'd call it all care and no responsibility in the sense that I sat around a table and kind of jammed with the writers, and you know, and we came up with lots of kind of mad ideas and we talked about an arc and, you know, at that stage I think it had been decided that we, you know, um, the only money that was available was to make a little six, you know, six half-hour episodes, so we knew, you know, what the shape of it would be. And um, we talked in very general terms about that arc, and then we talked, uh, you know, w it was bare bones, and then I, w I ended up working in Australia a lot over that period of time, and so I was just being fed scripts and drafts and ideas the whole time and, and just feeding back, you know. And I, and I guess the really interesting... The, the interesting conversation I remember was the relationship between story and character. And because, because I was in the mix so early on, we talked, you know, a lot about character. And there was, there was some very useful... Um, I mean, I remember a statement made at one point where I went, where's the character, where's the character, and what comes first? And we discovered ov over that time what was really useful in the end was because we'd done so much, and at my demand, I suppose, we'd done so much in-depth work about the character and who this person was and how, you know, her idiosyncrasies and her eccentricities and her history and all the rest of it, that how she responded to situations beca almost wrote themselves in a way. And that was, that was an, a, for me, a really interesting and informative part of the process because I'd never you know, helped make a story before at, at that point. And um, so th there was a lot of back and forth and argy bargy and all the rest of it. And then uh, very c towards the end, we also pulled in a second writer, Vanessa Alexander, who we'd originally got on as the first director. And she's also a writer. And so she came in quite late and she brought another comic voice to the scripts, and so her and Maxine then worked together with me bleating in both of their ears, you know, right up until the last minute. So I think the last few episodes were still being written while we were shooting episode one. So it was incredibly fast. And, you know, I mean, I kept saying right through the whole thing, this feels like co-op theatre to me. And it was w one, of the, one of the sort of, I guess, the positives of having so little money is that there were so little people in there, there were so few people involved you know, we could all squash into a room and we were all busy telling each other how to do each other's jobs. And because <laughs> there were so few of us, we could kind of get away with it, you know? Did you find, like in terms of the feeling that you had the control to change dialogue and did you find that on set that you felt, or once the scripts were agreed on, did you pretty well stick to the script? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, we really, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. We kind of... Um, Again, and I think it was this sort of co-op theatre thing we had going because Vanessa was a writer and she was on set a lot and because Peter Salmon, who was our second director, you know, he was working very closely with Vanessa and Rachel and Max were around all the time and because we were such a small family and probably because I was 
in, in the mix as part of the development team if we found that lines didn't work on the day. Uh, often it became about cutting lines, often it became about just get, getting rid of stuff. All the yap yap just kind of, you know, I mean, and Anna yaps a lot, so, you know, I was happy to lose, <laughs> you know, as much of it as possible. But um, there was, uh, you know, we, no, there was a lot of play. There was a lot of play, but also what was great was that both Vanessa and Peter um, I trusted a lot, and Vanessa, when she puts her foot down, you, you kind of don't want to cross it. So, you know, and, and she, it also became a thing of convince me, and she's a terribly convincing director. So, um, it, it felt it felt extremely, um, extremely and joyously collaborative. It Re really did, you know. Did it feel dangerous as well? Yeah, 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 because there was just no time. <laughs> there was no time and no money. And you don't know, do not do you? I mean, a, in, in a, when, you're w w when you do a play and you, you, you're doing your opening night of a play, I, I've always felt that the audience tells you what it is that you've made. You know, the audience throws it back at you. So you, you get a sense of where the laughs are you, and, you know, and if there's a sort of a silence at the end of the play, you know you've screwed up somewhere and if there's a you know, thunderous applause, you know you've done all right. But, interestingly but with television, you don't know. But interestingly, with a play, and especially if it's a, a, a well-written play, if it's not working, you assume it's your performance, not the script. And sometimes in the, the process of an actor discovering how to make a script work, they discover something quite, u quite special. Yes. Whereas if the actor has the power to change the script, sometimes you may get a competent performance that avoids some of the ugly bits. At the same time, you may not have to dig, dig as deep to discover things that may be in the script. Yeah, I agree with you. And I've always felt that there's right. a... No, 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 <laughs> I agree. I agree. And it's a really... It's, it's an interesting... Uh, it's an interesting balancing act because on one hand, and you know, as an actor, I, I have been that actor that said my character wouldn't do that. And then at some point along the line, you think to yourself, wow, what would happen if my character did do this or did say this? Mm. This then becomes interesting. So um, my kind of only answer to that is you hire really skilled <laughs> actors because actors, good ones, tend to know. They tend to know when, when a line really isn't working or when you don't really need to say it and they tend to know when, you know, and, and they can come up with another option, but also if, if it really is gonna work, they'll go, you know, they, they will go. Obviously that was a self-serving question. Yes, <laughs> yes, no, but it's, 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 an, isu it, it's an issue, and, and I don't know that there's an easy answer to that one. Um, so moving on to Rachel and, and Blue Rose, something you said about giving Siobhan and, and Tony something different to do than what they were doing on Outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why? Because what, a, what, a, what a, as before when I was doing my preamble, overseas a star is a star because the audience lo loves a certain thing about them and often when stars have tried to approach it differently, the audiences have deserted in droves. And I'm just wondering why so soon after one show you felt that, that like those characters needed to be changed um, well, for it, the audience. It, wasn't, question, it wasn't soon for a star, <laughs> it was quite a while. I mean, in terms oh. of their presence on screen. Oh. oh. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, okay, I can always shout. Um, it wasn't that soon for a mm. start. Um, I think New Zealand is a very weird country when it comes to actors. Um, it's, I, it really frustrates me, I'm just gonna sidebar <laughs> here, about the whole thing of, oh, it's the same old actors, why can't you find some new ones? They were on Shortland Street. Well, Shortland Street is the best training um, ground in the country. Actors get experience um, because they're good. And the other thing that always frustrates me mightily is when networks go, um, I want a really sexy 40-year-old man in New Zealand who's a very good actor. Um, and you go, where will they have come that from? That we've never seen That before. we've never seen before. Mm. And those mm. people just don't spring from nowhere. They've got to do work to, to get that experience. Um, so, but I'm also finding it really ironic with Go Girls where we have taken a risk and changed the cast and they're going, oh, but where's the old cast? Oh, I don't want new ones. So you really can't win in mm -hmm. New Zealand. I, I'm sure Robin <laughs> understands this. People, people loved her as Cheryl, but it's hard for her to be something different. They would like her to stay the same, but if you put, this, if you put Cheryl in Agent Anna, they'd probably go, oh, but where are the rest of the Outrageous Fortune cast? Do you know? It, it, there's no winning here. So I think we just have to go, right, we live in a weird country, which is a, a tall poppy syndrome abounds. 
Um, really, I, James and I had this idea, and we had some ideas for these characters. Um, I know those actresses really well, and I know what they can do. Um, I wanted to stretch them. I also wanted to use how they move and things I know really well about them and to give them a chance to play at something different, um, which was kind of a risk, but, uh, but a very calculated one because I knew, I, I, I can hear their voices in, in my head when, I'm, um, when I know an actor really well. Whose their vo voices are they? Are they them from Outrageous Fortune or are they some kind of... They're a hybrid. I mean, I find it really interesting when you've made up any character um, you, you, well, you know this. It, it, what you've got is an essence. It's like a ghost. You know the essence of the spirit of the character that you want. And so when you audition for a role, you're trying to find the person who will inhabit and, um, like a genie, fill this and inspire it. And, and what you're looking for then is once you've got that and you hear them and see them doing that, that feeds the future writing that you're doing with that character. So the way they play it and what they bring to it and their inflections are all kind of grist to the mill. Um, but if you get it wrong and that person can't fully inhabit the character, then it's all going to go horribly wrong. So there's a terrible secret here about writers, is that we steal the ghosts of actors out there and base our characters on them. <laughs> but then the really terrible thing is that actor comes and auditions sometimes and we go, oh no. <laughs> or somebody else does a completely different take on it. We go, oh. Well, the interesting thing, though, is, um, you know, if we're talking about actor-driven things, I mean, back on, way back on Shorten Street, Robin auditioned for a doctor. Um, and Gavin went, come and have a look at this, come and have a look at this. Th there's this really great audition turned up. She's not right for the doctor, but she would make such a good nurse. Wouldn't she be great as this long-suffering but Slut plucky Nicardi. nurse, the Slut Nakati? And so we wrote the role, that role, for Robin. So that was... Yeah, <laughs> so we went, oh, let's get her to do that. So oh, it was Actually, I was more, it was more like, oh, if I was really sick in hospital, that's the nurse I'd like to wake up to. <laughs> <laughs> and that tells you more about Gavin than you possibly want to know. <laughs> Whereas the doctor was just a small role and we didn't want to waste her on that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, um, pervy I'm guy. embarrassed now. Pervy guy from um, Nothing Trivial. <laughs> um, oh. On um, Agent Anna, mm -hmm. I read some of the internet stuff going on about, as research for this, I don't normally pry into that world because it's too depressing. But um, I, j I just mean the stupid things people say. They they make you challenge, you know, question your own work, and you could never write if you're worried about it too much. Did you, did you read the one that I saw today? I'll never watch that Hobbit killer on television ever again. Did you see <laughs> that one? <laughs> no, but I was interested in the discussion about um, because Agent Anna's character is so far away from Cheryl West. It's like sometimes I feel watching it that she's more further away from Cheryl West than sometimes the script is. Right. Oh, that is interesting. In, in yeah. terms of, and I'm just wonder, wondering how, what you take to it, and what you took to the role in terms of, was that a really conscious, I'm pushing that away and I'm going to... Oh. Um, uh, I would say unconscious probably, right. you know. I, I would say that I was playing constantly when a, you know, like, being and enjoying being in a totally other world. I wasn't deliberately not being her, uh, you know, trying not mm. to be Cheryl. But um, I mean, I think, you, you know, you, you, you talk to any actor who's done a range of film and television and theatre, and you'll probably find that anyway. You know, it's like, m you know, the, the, the odd experience in, in being a character like Cheryl West for a long period of time is it was very, you know, like it was so high profile, and yet in terms of in terms of its relationship with the audience, but you know, m m my career is, uh, you know, I've been 50, 55 odd characters over that, over my time as a professional actor, and all of them have been all over the place. And so, uh, some of it, to, to answer the question really honestly, I would say that there probably was some of that unconsciously, but also um, the, the character herself, the woman that I was interested in, demanded that. And that was a s that was a separate issue, yeah. 
Cool. I reckon we should probably look at the clips now if we, if we can, just to... Why not? Um, oh, maybe uh, the chair one, maybe. Yeah, just because we were talking about that. Is it, did I call it the chair one? Anyone know any jokes? Very good, isn't it? I do find it, well, to fill in, it's, it's sort of interesting that you've got Oscar playing against type because he's a comedian. You've got Agent Anna playing against the type that most New, Z New Zealanders will know you as. And you've se suggested that you went out of your way to try and make Antonia and Siobhan's characters different than what? It's just, do you think this is a New Zealand thing? I mean... <laughs> um, I, I actually thought I, I... What I was mainly interested in was changing the power dynamic between them. Right. Um, because um, Loretta was such an evil, bossy cow and Pascal was the sort of quite clever but sort of dumb as slut, if you like. <laughs> and I just wanted to change that power balance. That was one of the main things. But you can't hide the fact that, that Antonia still comes across as a very smart, sharp cookie and that oh, Siobhan I'd comes I'd across as more instinctive. I'd <laughs> yeah, well, that's working with what the actresses right, are really yeah. good at. So do you hear that when you're writing those roles? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I've, that's what I mean about working with what... Uh, I know them really well and I know what they're really good at. And in real life, Siobhan is a very thoughtful person. She's mm. not a kick slut at all. Mm. Um, but she has a very instinctive way of working. And I remember actually like, a really funny time when we were at an outrageous fortune lunch. You were there and the actors were... Uh, that just all going, um, oh, we really need more rehearsal time. We, we really need a lot more and all this kind of stuff. And we're talking about process and all this kind of thing. And Siobhan leaned over and went, I'm happy with not doing very much. <laughs> 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 because she instinctively you well, got it without major amounts of rehearsal and she did a great job. And so every actor has a different process, I guess. Good. You take the rent, you add a zero. The price isn't going lower than that. No, there's no GST. No, property investors don't pay tax. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, get back to me. What is it, Kingston? Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not. I, I always apologise. Say what you want. I am busy. I'm sorry. I thought you said you weren't. I'm not. It's, it's just a thing I always keep saying. I honestly don't know why I do. I'm sorry. Stop saying sorry. Sit. Speak. I'm sorry. I am not happy. I spent hours putting all those copies together and I really think I deserve a listing. I promised Sandy I wouldn't let you touch them. You lost your only listing after a single open home. But that's because I reminded the buyer of his ex-wife. I'm really, really, really good with people. Honestly. Please give me a good one. I've got a rental. Owners are overseas and they're looking for a quick sale. Do I have to talk to the tenants? I've done it. I've even done the flyer. It doesn't look like much, but you find a buyer and they'll meet the price. Uh, I should get that. script did it have her saying sorry as she ran off? No, no, I, I think, um, I think uh, that I don't remember that scene because I had a terrible flu. <laughs> so but what, I, what, I, what I do remember was that it was one of those ones where um, the, the, the script had a, oh hello, the, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the script was a, a kind of a nice backbone and, um, and Adam and I played with it a bit and the chair thing happened because the, the, that was what the chair was like and so we, 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 we just worked with that and, um, and the sorry thing was just you know it's, it's I mean and, and, and these guys would, would attest to this as well that when you know when you know your character and you know the story that you're telling and you know the story of the scene sometimes the dialogue it, it, it matters but it doesn't it, 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 
the, the precision of it can come and go a bit in the sense that if you're really sure of what it is that you're doing, you can lose a line or you can add it here or you can add it there if, if you kind of know your onions. And I'm not saying I knew my onions then because I was sick, but it was a happy accident, that little scene, and it was because of the chair, which was nice, and, 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 and the kind of playing that we did. Mm. I absolutely agree, unless anyone's working on one of my shows. <laughs> yeah. Um, should we see the other clips? Because we're going to run out of time and I want to give time for some questions here. Oh, a bit of Harry. This is a unique treat. Actually, well, actually one thing I want to say about this is that this is um, ungraded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is really, this is straight Who's from the offline. Who's to you? This is, and it's, no, we haven't sound mixed or anything. <laughs> so this is very much, you know, working Harry. And in this scene, just to give you some bit of background, he's interviewing... Um, a white collar criminal. We saw your editor the other day and he said it's fantastic. Yeah, but he is paid to say that. The thing is also, um, and Michaela Rooney had a lot to do with the scene because we brought her in as a script editor at a, at a late stage in the writing um, for, for fresh legs and energy and Michaela was um, instrumental in the scene. Who's Wayne Fahey to you? You might know him as Chocker. Never heard of him. Are you sure, Colin? Because you look quite cosy here. Hmm? Hello. What's your name, man, eh? Okay, um, please, the lady leave. That's a lovely name. Well, you just want to have a little talk to your mum. Do you reckon you could go to your room for a little bit? Do as you told, darling. Everything's okay. <laughs> Seat See that kid? He'd only been inside a few days. Look what they did to him. You don't have a fucking clue what goes on inside somewhere like Harry Max. Men a lot tougher than you get fucked every which way every single day. They rip that ass of yours wide open as soon as look at you. And then knock your teeth out to make it easier for some fat fuck to come in your mouth. I'm not bullshitting here, Colin. This is how it is. Unless you start talking. You don't know Chocker like I do. So you do know him. I just can't. That's fine. Your choice. <clears throat> but if you change your mind, don't bother calling. This chat was a one-time offer. artistic director of the Bel Belvoir Street Theatre in Sydney for years said once, I understand, I think Frank Whitten told me this, that he, he loves to cast clowns mm. in everything, that he finds that, you know, it's just, it just occurred to me watching Oscar, that, that the, the funny guys, you know, the comedians, you know, you talk about the sad clown, you know, there's, a, th there's something underneath that, you know, sort of the bigger the front, the bigger the back thing. And, and it's, it's, I can see what you're talking about with Oscar, is that, you know, he's known as the funny guy. You know, I think that Jeffrey Rush apparently was, was that way, he was always playing these kind of clownish characters, but there's great depth underneath it. And, and I, I think that's kind of a, a wonderful observation to make about performance. 
The other thing I'd say to that, though, you have to be intelligent. You just, and clearly, you know, Oscar's a smart guy, and I think the people you've talked about, Jeffrey Rush, Robbie Coltrane, you know, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. they're all clever, they're really clever people. And so, therefore, and Eric Banner, none of them, if you, that you, would, you would have a really insightful, informed conversation. They could tell great gags, obviously, but, and also, I think, you know, as I alluded to before, and, and um, but I think each of them has a pain or an anger, and I don't know what it is, I'm not, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but, Oscar has a unique experience of, as I said, of racism. And again, I don't want to overplay that because you know, he's, he's a big boy and he, and, and he wouldn't take any shit from anyone. But I think there's, he's, there are many ways in which a Polynesian male is hurt in some respects. And you know, it, it, it makes for a great complex character and as an actor. Also, you know, as I alluded to before, Oscar's got bags and bags of so much untapped talent. And the thing for Harry is, I mean, obviously, I would love there to be lots of series of Harry, because I'd like to ask you guys this. Did Cheryl West, how true was Cheryl? Was she there from day one? Or was it series two that Cheryl became Cheryl, the, uh, the definitive one? Because I'd like to know that between you guys. Because um, I think the, th the reason I'm asking is because I think it'll happen with Oscar as Harry. He will become Harry in subsequent series more prof profoundly than he is now. Um, Cheryl was there from day one, and um, she was she was the centre of the series, in that her decisions and her rules were what actually made everyone else run. Um, so the interesting thing with her was then developing her across series. Um, yeah. No, she was there from the first moment the idea was made up. Yeah, no, I didn't mean like that. I mean, it's more like Robin's portrayal. When, when does Robin's portrayal of Cheryl become sort of, in, in your mind, the one and the same? Episode one. So Episode one. So Robin brought nothing to the role? No, no. Yeah, Robin yeah. was hugely important to the role, but she was there and present in it one, and um, then it was all on from there, you know? I mean, that's, that's, that's what it you... It was a happy marriage, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's what you're looking for as a writer. You're trying to find that this genie mix of the character you've got in your head and the actor who's going to bring their spirit and they're going to ignite together. And quite often, we write roles with an actor in mind um, and, you know, we'll, kind of in the back of our mind, we'll think, I mean, like, on well, Nothing Trivial, and Michelle was kind of, Nicole Whippy was in the back of my mind for that character. Um, but at the same time, I left myself open because I thought, well, there could be other actors out there who could cane her ass when it came to the audition and, and bring something else to the part. So you need, you need to remain open if you're not casting for a specific Actually, person. you know, that's a really, really good point because on Harry, we discovered with um, Oscar's boss um, was modelled on, on Grimm, uh, the, real, the, um, uh, the real Neil Grimstone was larger than life, and, and he would regale us with what it's like to be a cop. And, he, and we spent nearly $10,000 at the Gypsy Tea Rooms, I was going through this the other day, basically <laughs> listening to Grimm tell us stories. And that was a lot of our research. And it sounds incredible. It, it, it was hard, we put on a lot of weight. But the thing about it was that Grimm was so, he's a born raconteur, that we tried, and we didn't have the skills to do it, we tried to create the character across from the Gypsy Tea Rooms, the tea rooms, the raconteur, onto the page. And so we came to this big disaster when we were casting because we couldn't find any actor in Cooey who could play Grimm. And we sort of really boxed ourselves into a corner because we had gone down the authenticity and, you know, the real life. And so that's why, one, it was one of the reasons why we actually reached out for Sam Neill, who, again, came on board and he wasn't Grimm. And one of the first things, by that stage, stage we changed Grimm's name to Socks. But fundamentally, it was helpful for our production, immensely helpful, that a pro like Sam came on board because we had lost sight of the fact that we're talking about a created character, not a, not a, um, you know, a copy of a real life human being. And Sam's, because he was so late in the process, he was, he was only announced the week before we started shooting, his, that actually saved us a lot because his distance from the project and his professionalism meant that he gave stocks a completely new spin that, that, that if we're honest, we didn't see coming. And actually it was a blessing in disguise because if we'd tried to, to do Grimm as we'd known him, it would have ended up like a parody and it would have been crap. The, the, there's a re uh, people choose to become actors often because there's certain aspects of their personality that don't translate in the real world. <laughs> And in the real world, there's people that will never become actors because of who they are. 
and sometimes that essence in television, I mean, this is the thing we're talking about casting, where we, we're, we're always explaining this to actors that you may have done a really good audition, but you're not right for the role. And it's because the camera, especially in television, we're doing it so quickly, the camera just looks and goes, huh, this is what you're like. And it's, 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 it's terrible. I mean, some actors <laughs> are genuine chameleons, but it's very hard to be a chameleon on camera because yeah. the camera will see into you. And if it's also because characters are ideas. They are, um, they're there to fulfill a larger function in the story. And so there is, you will want the audience to feel a certain way about them. And, and some actors, bless them, no, they're the nicest people in real life, but they always come across as villains. So if you try and cast them as a lovable hero, you're on a hiding to nowhere already. And, and the opposite is true. If you want someone scary and you've got this, some real cutie you, who you cast, you, you've killed your drama. So that's, that's the part of the alchemy is finding the right... Sometimes. Right paint box. And sometimes you, like. you can cast against type as you're talking about. Because there was, I read a really interesting essay once, which I can't work out where it is now, but basically it was talking about dead man walking and it was saying that the two leads are really interesting, complex characters and the other characters around them are stock types. And they weren't saying this is a criticism, they were saying basically the audience has only got time in, in an hour, in two hours, sorry, to, to take in those two characters and appreciate them for all their complexities. If they're trying to work out all the other characters and if all the other characters are sort of being cast against type, the audience can get really confused because you don't know where the fuck you are and you're kind of used to certain parameters to tell your story in. And sometimes when you're casting a series, you want the audience to feel really quickly a certain way about characters and you don't have time because you're concentrating on your leads and want to explore them more deeply. But sorry, I'm should we, we should go into Blue Rose. For it. Oh, look, we'll, we'll do a lot of publicity for Sam, but the, one of the, actually the key thing is Oscar was instrumental. Um, if any of you went to the big screen symposium last year, Oscar um, interviewed and in inverted quotes Sam, and, and they were um, magnificent. They were just fantastic. So they have a they have a friendship, but also I think Sam's now at the age of stage of his career that. He, um, New Zealand is home, and he was open to the idea of a high-end drama appearing in it, not without some trepidation, um, and his agent, who's been pretty good, made it really clear that if we fuck it up, you know, um, it, there's, there, there'll be hell to pay, but I'm pretty confident that Sam won't be sort of, you know, um, going through airports with dark glasses after Harry goes to air, at least I hope not. It's very funny, um... I thought it was funny. I heard Sam on the radio saying about how fast it was. And then I talked to Peter Berger, who was directing, and saying how slow he was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> just the experience of, of fast turnaround television, even quality television is fast in New Zealand. I'm sure it is. A lot of people are used to. Sorry, more questions? Who's this director that, sorry? Uh, that um, used to happen before the writers were involved in the casting and that's been a real key change because no matter how much you write on a page and how much you write in a character note there, as you know when you, what you're talking about is all that time that you spend talking about the character and the nuances of the character um, if, if someone else casts them like a director they'll usually cast someone pretty um, but they won't know the depth of the character. So now, us guys, we, we cast in conjunction with the producers usually of the show we're working on and we cast exactly who we want. And occasionally we screw up, but really, really rarely um, because we're looking at the audition and we, we, we debate amongst ourselves about who we think might be best. And sometimes actors aren't available or don't want the role 
but we always get the person we want. Just about. Control freaks. Um, but, but taking Stephen's point, sometimes the person we want just doesn't exist, in which case we make compromises all the time. Yeah, I mean that the age group, the forty, the forty-year-old male that no one's ever seen before, who's a fucking good actor. It's 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 just it's like the you know the Holy Grail. You keep <laughs> looking for it, but it's character note. He is forty. Women, the kind of man that men like and women swoon over. Hmm. Interesting. Just that gentleman's question, though. Following up, we had, I, I won't say the person, but we had an actor in it who had tested and it was a fine actor, and no reflection on him. But in in a critical couple of early scenes with Oscar. There was zero chemistry between them, and we made the decision, well, instantly, that it was too important for the series to have um, even a you know character actor not being able to um, harmonise, I suppose, on screen. So unfortunately, that we had to replace them, and we did it with again no reflection on that uh, actor's ability. But if there's no chemistry, as Gav said before, that is fatal. If you plough on hoping that they'll get it right. One, um, a, one of the things that we often do if we're casting an ensemble or, a, a, you know, there's an important love interest for a character, we'll try and get the two actors together to read. So the hopefuls will, you know, we'll have a short list and we'll get them, to, if we can get, if the, actors if the other cast actor is available, we'll get them together so that we can see how they work together and if they're comfortable or, or, and what, it also, but also there's a great trap if you're, in the room with the actors, you get a completely different read from what the camera sees. So the actor might be having a lovely time with this actor and think they're really great, but they actually it doesn't play on screen, and actually the actor they don't like as much. You may have great zingy chemistry. It's just really weird. Yes? They are the sa they're the same thing. I mean, you can't separate the character and the story. The sort of definition of character is sometimes what they do. What they do in a certain situation defines character. So the two things you can't yeah, separate. You can't, you can't really separate them um, because the character, all, the, all your characters or a number of your characters are driving your story mm. or, or they are opposing your story and that's drama because it's all about what people do and say and don't say what they want and can't get. So, sorry, any more questions? That's <laughs> not true. Actually, actually I did want to ask, um, in our experience, it in was it when we first started, and over the years we've built up a relationship with the networks, and now and again, the network will say, and, and I have to say this is rare, this is rare, it's not, it's not Generally, we put forward the characters, the, the actors that we want, and now and again, the, the network will say, no, we don't want those ones. And we will, for various reasons, um, there used to be a previous program, it was because they didn't like their hair, but generally speaking, True. it's not like that. Um, and what we've done in the past is got the same actor that we want back in three or four times, got them to re-audition, got Often them to play got against... Often got their hair done. <laughs> <laughs> got them to play against various actors until we got them... There's been a very there's been there's been a few actors that the network have said no to, and we've sat with them and watched it. And nine times out of ten, the, the network have ended up agreeing with us. And one time out of ten, we've ended up agreeing with the network. So you know, it, it is a dialogue. It's not a us I mean and them situation. It's a collaboration. I mean, in the end, they want someone who's going to look good on the poster, because their interest is marketing and sales. Um, and you know, that sounds shallow, but you know, it's all about bums on seats and advertisers and you're naive if you don't accept that. Um, so yes, they have, most networks have the right to veto or approve an ongoing cast member. And as long as you kind of don't get into bullish resentment mode about that and see it as a collaborative process, um, then it can work out okay. Occasionally they'll fight you and then you have to be very persuasive. Well, no, you see, because we're talking, Actually, this, is, this is an exception. What we're talking about is weird. 
Actually, I have to tell you, it, it, it is swings and roundabouts and fashion. I was going to say to Stephen, as a producer, ask a question which was, is it, do you think it's easier to get your project funded if you've got a name attached to it? Well, Gav, going back to the, the point, if I'd gone to Cat... OK, we had, you know, five minutes of, you know, credit in the bank, as I said before, without the blue. Mm. But if I'd gone to them with, um, I suspect, a lesser recognisable face than Oscar, Harry, given the fact we had, you know, effectively it was an oral pitch or a very flimsy document, mm. then not even as long as your email, Robin, but, you know, we would have got turned down there and then. So uh, uh, this goes back to what Working Title, the British company, Br British producers do. You know, they're, they're great believers in, in having um, uh, films that are either based on something that what they call pre-audience appeal, and either it's a novel like Bridget Jones's Diaries, or it's, 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 an, it's a star who they may not know anything about. The, you know, it's the basic Hollywood um, formula. Russell Crowe was, you know, was a schizophrenic mathematician um, in A Beautiful Mind, but we all went to see him because he was Russell Crowe. If it was, you know, let's say William H. Macy in the role, great actor there he is, it's probable that A Beautiful Mind, for example, wouldn't have had the prominence it did. With any other actor, I suspect, for the, f for, for the pitch we had for Harry, other than Oscar, um, we would, I wouldn't be here tonight. I mean, I do think it's, it's, um, it's different for everything. I mean... Um, there is still a kind of push for fresh faces and people do want to see someone new in roles. So, I mean, they, there are, there are recognised actors who, who are kind of bankable in New Zealand. You know, I mean, it's, what does that mean? But, um, but at the same time, they are looking for fresh faces all the time. I mean, Outrageous Fortune was amazing when we were casting that because this woman here, we wanted her for Cheryl and the audience was going, but how... How will they accept her as Cheryl when she's Ellen Crozier? And that seriously was a concern to TV3 that, that everyone's forgotten now. But they, they couldn't see how anyone in the audience could see her as anything. And so we should truly we look for someone that no one knew. Actually, on that point, TV3 had an issue with one of the characters in um, Harry because of the Blue Rose. It was Anna Julienne. Mm -hmm. Now, we knew nothing of Anna, um, of her role. But they were v when we put her up for... Um, for uh, the role of uh, Jenny Chisholm, we had, that was our biggest, not our fight, in fact, TV3 were great with that, but they were very concerned that one project would cannibalise the other in terms of how they wanted their act. And actually, that's a valid point, if they've, you know, but in the end, a compromise was made, and, and we think that she'll be utterly different from the Blue Rose, but in that sense, I do have some sympathy with the network, you she know. Is, she, is, she is a true chameleon, she's great. Yeah, so that's, I think, how it was possible for it to happen. Any more questions? <coughs> for the whole series or just or for another series? Yeah. 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 I mean you just tell you can't think about that far in advance, so you tell the story that you're telling for this series. So generally what we do, you know, James and us, is we, we all try and block out the story for our 13 episodes of this series and try and make it um, interesting and unique and give the characters interesting arcs and try and end on some kind of high point so that if we make another one, we've got, you know, chops to chew on when we come back. I mean, I always think we leave them wanting more. Um, if you close everything off because you might not get another one, that's a mistake, <laughs> audience-wise. That's it then? <coughs> last questions, last questions, last questions going. Uh, one last question down the back corner. <laughs> Run with it. Um, write them up. <laughs> Yeah, give them, give them more to do. There's always the danger, too, that you fall in love with the secondary characters and you have to stop yourself from writing them up. <laughs> yeah, because <coughs> as Gavin's saying, you know, often, often your central characters are more complex and dramatic and you can have a lot of fun with your secondary characters who are often quite broad and so they'll, they'll often start to... Yeah, <laughs> they'll often... They will try and take over. <laughs> Look at me!
I think, though, with the Blue Rose, you've got the great advantage with that title that you can, for whatever reason, if you, you could decide to emphasise certain characters in subsequent series, say. But with Agent Anna and Harry, if Harry or Anna aren't the central character in most of their scenes, then, you, then the pack with the audience is broken. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> Agent Anna's other person. <laughs> in series two, Harry needs a house and he's going to go to Eden Realty. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'll just do a few thank yous to the New Zealand Film Commission who provide us with most of the money we have to do this kind of thing, the ASB Community Trust for their support, Heritage Hotels. Thank you to Alan Johnston for coming along tonight to film the event and to White Studios who have provided the equipment for him to do that. Um, please stay and have a piece of pizza. We've got some pizza out there, and get yourselves a drink. Um, and also, finally, and most boringly, there's some survey forms on the tables that you got given when you came in. Please take a couple of minutes to fill them out. It's really good for us to know who you are, um, what you do, etc. And it's also really helps us to continue getting this funded. So um, that would be great. Last of all, thank you all very much for coming. And most of all, thank you to our panel and to Gavin for sharing their experience with us tonight.